That's the question today. If you're following along in your Rooted book, we have ended week two. We're going to start tomorrow with day one of week three. And if you don't have a book yet, we're still ordering some more. And so you can join us on this pilgrimage. We had over 70 ordered. Now we're going to have over 80. That's almost over half of our congregation. And if you're sharing your book with your spouse, that's great. We encourage you to do it however you do it. It's like my fourth time, and I'll be going through it five or six times this this fall, as well as we may start some rooted groups in January as well. So if you haven't chosen to join us with that, if you're joining us online, contact us or put it in the chat and we'll get you a book, uh, mail it to you. You have to pay for it, but we'll uh, send it to you so you could join us as well. Today, we're going to talk about the nature of God. In other words, God's godness. Now, God's godness, no one else can have. If you were reading along this last week, we were Imago Dei, made in the image of God. But believe it or not, I hate to inform you that you're not God. How difficult is it for an atheist to live with the logical conclusions of his or her beliefs. I was reading this week, and yes, there are still atheists around. In fact, a friend of mine who I've gotten to know, Steve White, who was the minister of Plainfield Christian Church, has been meeting with an atheist friend of his for 15 years. It's a long time. And his atheist friend and him have a teasing relation, re, re, uh, teasing relationship. And his atheist friend says, "You're you're never going to baptize me." And Steve says, "Oh yes, I am. I'm never going to come to Christ." And just and and Steve says, "Oh yes, you are." And they've carried on and and shared together, and and Steve has been asked by him, why do you stay in relationship with me? Because I have no interest in Christianity. And Steve says, because I love you and I care about you and you are my friend, regardless of whether you ever believe. And and people are not projects, are they? They are made in the image of God, called to be redeemed, to be restored into that shalom that we talk about. Atheists struggle with the idea of God, and yet two nuclear, or actually two astronomical physicists, Russians, Zydlikov and Novikov, both refer to nature with a capital N, that nature has chosen to be designed this way. They give godlike qualities to nature. Carl Sagan, who wrote Cosmos, he capitalizes the C in Cosmos because it he thinks it thinks. And so even those that don't believe in God who see the design and the intelligence behind creation still sense a God-like presence. Three-year-old girl asked her materialistic, atheistic father, where does the world come from? And he gave this long story about this Big Bang and the randomness of nature and of creation. And, And then he said, but some people believe that there is a God. And you know what she said? I knew it, I knew it, I knew that that it was him. Because even in her little heart, she knew that there was a God. So you might ask the question, what is God like? And I'm going to resolve all those uh, questions or that question in the next 20, 25 minutes. No, I'm not. Don't deceive yourself. The, there was a Buddhist poem written in the 12th century by Saigyo Hoshi after he visited a Shinto Grand Temple. And he wrestled with God. God is here. 
Who can know? Not I. Yet I sigh and tears flow. Tear on tear. We are in a time period after Christ, 2,000 years, where we can come to know God. And we're going to talk about God's Godness, his nature today. And if you're following along in the outline, you're going to like this message because you're going to be able to fill in the blanks today. I get so many complaints about not being able to fill in the blanks, but today you're going to, you're going to get there. God's Godness, his nature. And we're going to look at several characteristics or attributes to God. And we're not going to answer all the questions and we're not going to even handle it completely. Because truly, it's a mystery. But we can know God. First of all, we want to look at his omniscience. That he is all-knowing. I am not all-knowing. In fact, I'm reminded of my humanness and my limited knowledge. As we live in a technological age where knowledge is exploding. The psalm writer write it this way in Psalm 145. Five, he says, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Nothing surprises God. Can't surprise him because he knows everything. He's omnipotent. His omnipotence. He is all powerful. We have no comprehension of the power of God. In Jeremiah 32, 27, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Now, I believe we've all ran into things that are too hard for us, but not for God. God is always present, omnipresence. If you think of the vastness of the universe and and the utmost regions, God is already there. If you think of the deepest depth of the ocean, God is already there and he's present now. He's in this room and he is everywhere. Psalm writer writes, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, as we travel the vastness of the universe someday, God will all already be there. And God is loving and merciful. Loving and merciful. He is love beyond our imagination. Grace and mercy beyond our imagination. Again, the psalm writer writes, and these are just a few verses to convey God's godness. Not, not exhaustive. We just don't have time. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. God's love never, ever ends. And then he goes on in Lamentations, and the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. His mercy is amazing beyond description. But God is holy and righteous. Holiness and righteous. If you were reading in your rooted book this week, he talks about shalom. And that, that's going to be a theme in rooted. The peace and the wholeness and the wellness of God. Even as we Hoosiers have enjoyed these cool, crisp morning and 70 degree days this last week. Beautiful days. Maybe the best days in Hoosier land that there are. But they still are in a fallen creation. Our best day will never compare to God's holiness and wholeness. Isaiah 6 3 says this And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is holy, pure. And he is also faithful, loyal, and trustworthy to the extreme. 
Deuteronomy 7, 9, we believe was written by Moses. He says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And that would be us, wouldn't it? That he is faithful. But he also is immutable. And that word means to be unchanging. God never changes. To me, that's amazing. I change. I make mistakes. I reconsider. I have been wrong. And so have you. God has never been wrong. Never changed. Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. He's talking about his steadfast, eternal love does not change even when God's people are far from him and you are far from him. And he is ever wise. God's wisdom is unending. Now, I... I've known some smart people, some really, really smart people, some off-the-chart smart people, rocket scientists and physicists with double doctorate degrees, super smart. But they also haven't been very wise. God is not only all-knowing. He is all-wise. Paul writes in Romans 11, 33, he says this, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Always wise and yet always gracious. There is no one, nothing more gracious than our God. And Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And listen, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You know, as I preach about the characteristics, the attributes of God, what you have to realize is Christendom has been fighting about these attributes for thousands of years, literally. The nature of God, who God is. Is he, is he, uh, are we predestined to the point that we have no choice? That would be Reformed theology. Are, are we Arminian where we can lose our salvation and we have a choice on whether we follow God? And the answer is yes, because God is a mystery. Even in those attributes that I've just shared with you, we can't really define them all that well. Because God is infinite. He's beyond us really, really knowing the depth and the breadth and the width of his being, his nature. Skip Moen said this, and I'm quoting the Rooted book today. It says, God does not come to us in nicely defined, rationally explained thought categories like I just shared. That just gives us a picture. God does not fit himself into our theological textbooks. God breaks all the rules. It's a mystery. He is near yet transcendent, clothed in human form yet holy, more terrifying than can be imagined, yet compassionate, invisible yet revealed, judging yet merciful, sovereign yet humble. No matter where you look, God breaks the mold. That is our God. And he reveals himself in the Old Testament and the New Testament as our heavenly father. He is your heavenly father. If you are in Christ Jesus, you've been saved by his grace. You become a child of God. God is your father. Now, for some of you, your earthly father wasn't much. I'm sorry for that. But I just want to tell you that your heavenly father is all that and more than you will ever know. And he is crazy, crazy, crazy in love with you. J.I. Packer in Knowing God, which was a textbook of mine in college, he says it this way. You sum up the whole of the New Testament teaching 
in a single phrase. If you speak of it as a revelation of the fatherhood of the Holy Creator, in the same way you sum up the whole of the New Testament religion, if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's Holy Father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. That long quote basically says, God's your father and he loves you like crazy. And if you don't relate to him like that, you don't understand Christianity at all. And you need to know him personally in a way that you understand that he loves you like crazy. His grace and his mercy, he is for you like you would not believe. The eternal creator of the universe that created a molecule and an element and also the stars in the sky is your father and he loves you. In World War II, at the end of World War II, the the battle in Germany and in Europe was winding down and Hitler was sending children to the fronts, teenagers, whatever he had, elderly, There were three companies east of the Rhine, and and the U.S. forces, the American soldiers, had gotten across the east side, and they were basically massacring massacring teenagers. And there was a young German soldier named Carl Slicer, and they were surrounded. His battalion had three companies, and they were ordered to fight to the end. And they were decimated. Their company had 80 starting out with, but they were down to 18, and they were in the foxholds. And the American army had come. And Slicer fired four shots into a a barn, not seeing the Americans, but knowing that they were there. And then all of a sudden on the battlefield, there showed up this American soldier with his hands up, And he walked out in no man's land where everything was death. There were two German machine guns trained on that American soldier. But they didn't fire because it would have been murder. And you know what the American soldier said? Come on out. Come on out. It would have been like slaughtering a youth group of teenagers. And Carl Slicer, German shoulder, threw his helmet and his rifle in the foxhole and came out. The American soldier turned around and that whole company followed him out. Here's what Slicer writes. He said, he must have been the most reasonable man, the most perceptive, the most understanding, and by far the most brave. He had not expected we, we had not expected to live, and he must have seen how idiotic this all was. And he acted on his own to save us, risking his life in the process. Later in the prisoner of war camp, we talked about him. Don't you think? If he had not come to get us, we would have died in our foxholes. His action was a personal one. He was not ordered to do what he did. I owe him my life, and I have lived it. What would possess an American soldier to walk out on a battlefield unarmed, knowing that if they shot first, he would die, and yet at the same time, realized that there were teenage boys in those foxholes, barely older than 12 years old, that were children, and he didn't want to take their lives. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like the gospel. And you might ask the question, how do we know this God personally, creator of the universe? 
our Father. And God chose to reveal himself in Jesus as he was God in the flesh. John, the gospel, in the first few verses says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word came in the flesh as a baby and lived and died for us. Jesus said it this way in John 14, at at the night before he was crucified, he said, Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. See, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us of who God is, that he is Jesus who loves you, that gave his life for you. The Hebrew writer writes it this way. He says, he is the radiance. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the radiance of God. In the first few verses, he reveals who Jesus is in the book of Hebrews. You see, the cross is at the perfect intersection of human suffering and divine love. We have a God that understands suffering and pain and loss. Because he, too, experienced that. And at the same time, that grace, that mercy, that divine love brought him to that place. He chose to give his life for ours as a perfect sacrifice that we might experience the shalom, the wholeness, and the relationship with God the Father. And that's the relationship he calls you to today, to know him to know who is God, his Godness, if you will. Will you please stand as I pray this morning? Eternal God, we pray to you as our Father who sent his Son to give his life for us that we might know your love, your grace, your mercy, your presence in our life, your your wholeness and your holiness. Your nature that gives us peace and health and purpose and meaning and hope beyond this life because there's more to come. Father, for those that are wrestling with your existence, Father, I pray you would reveal yourself to them. For those that are wrestling with the image of Father in their hearts and their minds, I can't reconcile the human Father with a a Heavenly Father. I pray that you will reconcile, that you give them that peace, that understanding that you are for them, that you love them like crazy, that your grace is sufficient, your mercy is everlasting and never-ending. Father, For those that need to know your Son as Lord and Savior of their life, we pray that you would cause them to make that decision today, that your Spirit would move in such a way. For those that are present here and those that are online and watching, Father, I just pray that you would do your perfect work in their lives, that you draw them near, that they would be rooted and grounded in love and in faith. Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you come this morning?